Good evening. Welcome to the International Spy Museum. My name is Vince Houghton. I'm the museum's historian and curator. I'd like to welcome to uh, what should be a fascinating evening program um, about African American spies uh, during the early American period. And uh, one thing I, I find especially interesting about this is there there are libraries full of books written about intelligence operations. We have a library full of books here at the Museum about Intelligence Operations, hundreds if not thousands, but very few have been written about this early American period, this first 70, 80 years of American history. And even less have been written about the marginalized members of society that were involved in intelligence during this time. That's, that's a shame because this is the one real chance in intelligence history going up to relatively recently when these marginalized members of society, whether it's African Americans or women, have really been able to make a mark on American intelligence history. And so that's why we're, we're very pleased tonight to have Ken Daigler with us, who, uh, after a long career uh, at CIA, uh, began writing about this time period, been researching it, and he literally wrote the book on it, uh, Ken Daigler's book here, uh, Spies, uh, Patriots, and Traitors, uh, which focuses on the revolutionary period, uh, intelligence, which includes many of the uh, stories of these people you wouldn't hear about otherwise. Uh, he later wrote uh, several articles in the CIA's internal journal, Studies and in Intelligence, which is now available. Many of them are available online, but he wrote a very famous essay uh, called Black Dispatches. Uh, and so he is the world's leading expert on this period and the role of African Americans in American intelligence. So you're not here to hear me talk, so let me introduce to you Ken Daigler. It's always uh, difficult to be told or, or announced or introduced as the expert on something. I, I really can't claim I am the expert on it, far from it, but I, I have done quite a bit of research. Let me start by indicating that what I have up here is, is the anomaly. What we have here is a portrait, an actual, realistic portrait of James Armistead subsequently James Armistead Lafayette, probably the best known African American spy of the revolution. Certainly an individual who probably provided the most important intelligence deception plan during the war. What is interesting about this is we have so little material on African Americans involved in the Revolutionary War period, and yet here we have an accurate portrait of him taken from an 1824 portrait, the original of which is down the road in the south, down in Richmond, Virginia, in the Valentine Museum. And the reason I say this is kind of a dichotomy is because if I were to put up here a picture of Nathan Hale, one of the 200 statues, seven of which are all around Washington, D.C., you know, you'd assume that was really Nathan Hale, but what we all really know is that there are no real physical descriptions of Nathan Hale, and it's simply an idolized type of, type of portrait we have of him as the resolute patriot. So let me start just with the, the contradiction of the fact that we have an African-American spy who was really important and we actually know what he looks like versus the spy that everybody else thinks about for the Revolutionary War, Nathan Hale, whom we only think we know what it looks like. That is kind of a metaphor for intelligence in public. <laughs> You can imagine the difficulty of research involved in something like this, and there's a lot of interlocking reasons for it. I mentioned a few of them here, but they really are interlocking. For example, particularly in the southern and middle colonies, teaching an, an Afro-American slave to write and read was illegal and enforced, much less so in New England, and has continued right through the Civil War. So there was very little in the way of a literary tradition or capability to publish, or the ability of most individuals who were Afro-American to keep any type of a journal or a narrative of what their actual activities were. So you'd have to go to something like official correspondence of the US government, or you'd have to go to pension records. Okay, we get a little bit out of some documents, particularly when we get involved in the Southern Campaign where General Nathaniel Green had a little bit less operational security in terms of protecting 
the names of his agents than George Washington did over his entire career. So that was all right. We get to the pension applications. Well, here we come to a problem because most of the people we're going to talk about here never really fought. That wasn't their job. Their job was to spy. And you know you don't get a pension from the military for spying. You don't get a pension for being a soldier. So we didn't have that as a way to go. So sparse records. And then let's not forget the whole concept that comes in with espionage <clears throat> and the fact that the period I'm going to talk about contains two wars which were, in effect, really civil wars, where it was neighbor against neighbor, businessmen against businessmen, often people in the same family working on different sides. That meant that individuals who actually had maintained the secrecy of their spying activities really weren't big on having that brought forth after the war, after either war, because they lived in the same area. They were concerned about retribution. They were concerned about their social status. So that kept it down as well. Then we get into the cultural and the social prejudices, which are fairly obvious and were maintained for a very long period of time. And, and we face that when we talk about the, the military as well. There were also some complex intellectual issues that we don't always grasp in here, not the least of which was that you had different theories of history often being written by Southerners that were in vogue during a period from the 18th century into the 20th century. Things like the great man theory, where all history had to evolve around the narrative of the great man, normally George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. So the little man in history did not do very well at all in this. So there are a lot of interlocking reasons why this was a very difficult subject to come up with and why I'm going to be able to talk about some individuals by name, actually identify who they were and where they were and what they did, but can't really give you as much detail as I can, say, in the book here about, say, other people who did it. Uh, interestingly enough, much of the same problem of re researching African-American spies you face when you try to research women spies. So there is a similarity between it. The Revolutionary Era. Well, you know, we start as early as 1765 when the Stamp Act was the first attempt by Great Britain to really apply some type of taxation for payment of administration and defense in the colonies. And that spun up an organization called the Sons of Liberty. Now, most historians look at the Sons of Liberty and give them very little credit for being anything except a drunken mob. And if you've ever seen a photograph or of a woodcut or so of them, they always have distorted faces and they're always drinking and always drunk. Truth of the matter is, if you look at it from an intelligence perspective, for the 10 years they existed, from 1765 until 1775, they were quite a united front group that very effectively organized, propagandized, eventually took over shadow administrations. So sort of by 1775, they were basically running the country and a lineage of members of the Sons of Liberty go right through that. Starting as early as 1765, where there was a great deal of mob action, African Americans played a very significant role in the major towns, particularly in Boston and in New York City. And that's evident from the newspaper clippings and other comments that are made in, in the general press. By the time we get to 1770, we've actually got our first African American who gains a little bit of notoriety for it. That is Crispus Attatuck, who was one of the individuals who was harassing the four or five customs guards, British customs guards in Boston, in what eventually became the Boston Massacre, which was not quite as bad a massacre as Paul Revere and the Sons of Liberty meant to make out, but nevertheless cost uh, Mr. Attatuck his life. So he is normally accepted in history as the first Afro-American patriot to die at British hands. And there is indeed a commemorative US postage stamp that was put out to commemorate that. A more important, perhaps, little known event is when we get into the February-March period of 1775, when the British were starting to send out reconnaissance people to look and find where the Sons of Liberty and the local militia have hid the cannons, the gunpowder, and the other weapons that they have stolen for the past 18 months out of British arsenals. The first 
two individuals that went out were actually British officers dressed in what is described as country brown, which I assume would be a rough brown coat, leggings, and the, the broad-brimmed brown hat of, of the, the country folk up in rural Massachusetts. It was a lieutenant and an ensign, and they were sent out by gauge to do a reconnaissance and find out who was friendly between Boston and Worcester, because they knew at Worcester was a large supply of cannon and gunpowder that had been seized by the, by the Patriots. As they went through Cambridge, they stopped at the next town, which was Watertown, Massachusetts, and there they had lunch. And at lunch, they encountered a Afro-American serving woman at the tavern who served them, but happened to remember from her time of having lived in Boston that these individuals weren't just people out on the walk, they were two British officers. As soon as they left the tavern, she went immediately to the local committee of safety, advised the committee of safety of that, and subsequently these two officers were followed and monitored from Watertown all the way out to Worcester and all the way back. That same thing was repeated when the same two officers went out the second time to go to a place we're more familiar with, Lexington and Concord, as they reconnaissance that route. This is vitally important because it adds a slightly different approach to why the militia were able to do so much damage to the British troops retreating along Battle Road. It was because thanks to the committees of safety and this individual's identification and warning of the reconnaissance effort, that when the troops did march out and actually were known that they were going to Lexington and Concord, the militia knew exactly what route they were taking back because they had monitored the scouts who had gone out and done a reconnaissance on it. Very important aspect in, in this. When it come, I should say a few words here just about the military aspects. Starting as early as Lexington, we have Afro-American members both free men, and there were many of those in Massachusetts, and also slaves whose masters allowed them to join and own weapons in the local militia. And by the time we get to Lexington, uh, we've got Prince Esterbrook as one of the individuals who was wounded in the initial fighting there. By the time we get to Concord, you can see there are numerous individuals readily identified as, as African American who took part in the fighting. Now, one of the problems with this is we tend to go primarily on the identification of the individual as a Negro or by some of the names used because, interestingly enough, the militia did not break down their rosters by indicating what race they were from. So it's quite possible that we're underrepresented in terms of understanding this. So they were important at Lexington. They fought well at Concord. But I'm going to tell you about a guy that you've never, probably never heard of named David Lamson who I think did something even more important during that battle as the British were treated back down uh, Battle Road. David Lamson was an older individual, probably about late 60s, early 70s. He was too old to actually belong to the local militia. But he and a few other guys his own age still had their muskets, and they heard the sound of battle, and they decided they were going to go out and try to help out. So they moved towards Cambridge. And as they crossed the road, they happened to run into the British supply wagons bringing additional powder and cannon for the two cannon that the initial British relief column had brought to try to protect the troops retreating from the militia. Now the cannon had proved very effective because the way the militia had been fighting had been up in the tree lines and these two cannon, which had not been taken out initially, were used to spray grape shot into those lines as opposed to formations and consequently clear them, but they carried very little ammunition with them. So General uh, Gates immediately sent out the supply wagon consisting of more powder and more cannon. Lamson and his three associates addressed those people, asked them to stop, they refused to stop. Lamson and the folks shot them down, captured all of the wagons and the powder. Vitally important because had those had that equipment, the gunshot and the powder, been brought out and allowed the cannons to function, then after one third of the battle road, the British would no longer have had a difficult situation at all because they would have had superior artillery fire. Something that is a very small research point, but I think is indicative of, of a lot of what we're talking about here. 
Finally, at Bunker Hill, we have stories and documentation on many African-American soldiers fighting in militia companies as well as state colonial troop companies. An example of the fact that we don't have documentation, but yet that the value they produced during these battles was maintained is the popular stories. And, and this is another aspect because obviously since there was not written tradition, journals, what have you, pension requests, a lot of what we know are the oral traditions that come through and are passed along. Very hard to document, and a lot of historians don't give them much in the way of truth if, unless they can document them against actual official documentation. But there are stories to this day at the Bunker Hill Museum in, in Boston about Peter Salem and Salem Poor, two individuals who were credited with killing the two most senior British officers during a British attack on, on Bunker Hill. In the case of Peter Salem, he is credited, and I, I realize we can't prove this, with the shot that killed Major John Pickerin, who was the British Royal Marine officer who actually led the contingent that opened fire at Lexington and subsequently attacked at Bunker Hill. Salem Poor is credited with having fired the shot that killed Lieutenant Colonel John Alexander, the British line commander of the attacking forces at Bunker Hill. I think this indicates that there is at least popular and local recognition of the contributions that, that were made in that regard. I should talk probably a little bit more about a very confusing subject, which is the role of African Americans in the Revolutionary War in terms of commitment and military service. As I mentioned before, the militia, particularly in the North and a little bit in the middle colonies, had no problems enrolling any free black man. And with the permission of the owner, slaves were allowed to enroll as well and carry weapons, obviously much less so in the southern colonies. The state troops that actually responded and formed the first units of the Continental Army very much reflected the population of, of where they came from. These were units that came from townships and so represented the population of the townships, whether you were, were African American, Caucasian, German, in some cases Native American or what have you. So they were quite representational. By the time we get to Continental Army, we've got many units that are formed like the 4th Connecticut that is fully integrated. Several of the line regiments of the Massachusetts uh, state forces were fully integrated. There were integrated units uh, actually in parts of Virginia, surprisingly enough, that fought throughout the war. And of course, there were some special units. I think everybody heard probably of the first Rhode Island, which was an all black unit of light infantry. And a unit that is much less known called the Bucks of, of America, which was a Massachusetts small, what we would call today, scouting or special operations unit, all of whom throughout, fought throughout the war. State navies, even more percentage of African Americans because traditionally they had been allowed to be seamen. Continental Marine Corps, Continental Navy, exactly the same things. The Marine Corps has some quite good records that indicate that in the first several companies raised, there were several black Marines. Now this was all solved. This was a mess in the sense of <sighs> Continental Army, Continental Congress, what do the states want to do? It was a real mess until, of course, the question of need of manpower came up. And they finally solved this on 29 March 19, excuse me, 1774, when the Continental Congress decreed that any slave whose master agreed could join the Continental Army and upon good service and returning all of his equipment, he would be paid $50 and the Continental Congress would pay up to $1,000 to his owner to ensure his freedom. At that point, the point about manpower became much more overriding than anything else. Now let me talk about the essence of what I want to really talk to you about. The intelligence assets used. The African American, because of his place or her place in the social structure, made an excellent intelligence collector. I'll, I'll compare it to something like 
the servants at dinner in Dalton Abbey. You know, people were just totally ignored. It was assumed they were wallpaper. Consequently, African Americans could wander around the battlefield, could pretend not to understand, could be servants and overhear things. No one on either side said much of anything. And boy, did that work to our advantage. We have representatives here of Cato. Cato was the servant of an Irish tailor named Hercules Mulligan, who lived in New York City and ran a very exclusive tailoring shop that British officers and officials came to to have the latest fashions done with proper material imported from Great Britain. He also was married to the cousin of a British admiral, so socially he was in the, the proper mode. And his brother Hugh Mulligan was a merchant who had several contracts for supplies commodities, et cetera, with both the British Navy and the British Army. Cato was the servant and playing the role. Apparently, Cato had been taught to read and write and was quite an educated individual in his own right, had been taught to wander around, and he was the individual who actually carried the Finnish intelligence that Hercules Mulligan got back outside of British lines to give to another courier to take up to Long Island where the Culper Ring was centered for distribution into Connecticut and subsequently to George Washington. We have similar examples of this happening primarily in South Carolina where most of the battles were fought in the Southern Campaign. We've got a servant of Roger Saunders who was a plantation owner and merchant who did a lot of work in Charleston who was carrying information back on Charleston. We've got an individual named Prince working for an Edmund Petrie who does work at James Island, both as a courier and also as someone who wanders around and very detailedly observes what the British fortifications and supplies look like. In terms of collectors, I had mentioned that we had prinks, but interestingly enough, we think it's the same prinks, although that was a common name for, for slaves, but we think it's the same prinks who functioned for two different individuals, which would tend to indicate that his role was probably as important as the two individuals that he, he worked with, because once as a courier and then once as a collector, actually, on, on James Island. Then a little bit more inland, we've got a Benjamin Dominique. In Rhode Island, we've got an individual who seemed to be an African-American and Native American mixture who operated for several years inside Newport, bringing information on British supplies, troop landings, general plans and intentions out to the uh, forces outside. And, and, and we've got Antigua sitting in South Carolina. I'd love to tell you more about them as individuals, but we're lucky to pull them out of the 26 volumes of General Nathaniel Green's work just to find out that they were involved in intelligence. In this case, we just do not have an awful lot of information on them. Now, I can, do more, I can do better for you at Yorktown. And as you know, Yorktown was a relatively important battle. Two African-American slaves, interestingly enough, both of whom were highly educated, not just reading and writing, but educated, were involved, one tactically and one in a very important strategic deception operation that helped keep the British surrounded at Yorktown. First is Saul Matthews, who was, a, who was a slave, but his master allowed him to actually join the Virginia militia. And his role in the Virginia militia, once he joined, was literally that of supposed, supposed to be just a dumb individual who wandered all around picking up things, wandering between lines, acting as a servant here, doing something else there. When in reality, he was able to bring back the plans and intentions of the early British forces that were there before Lord Cornwallis arrived, allowing Lafayette, who commanded a small American group on the peninsula, to ensure that those forces were kept south of the York River in what eventually became the set piece battle of Yorktown. We know a little bit about him and we can certainly document him because he, he obtained his freedom and in the petition for his freedom that was granted you know, glowing reports of the amount of information on the details that he was able to provide and the impact it did have on American moves. 
But now we get to my favorite guy, James Armistead. Once again, he was a slave, but very well educated. He actually was officially a member of the Continental Army. But Lafayette learned of him from his commanding officer and seconded him to his own household, where he observed Armistead and subsequently decided that he was going to use him as a spy against the two commanding generals, one of whom was Benedict Arnold at the time, along with Cornwallis. He sent Armistead into British lines, claiming that he was coming there to get his freedom. He indicated that he had been a house servant and therefore well skilled in the etiquette of serving and what have you. And Cornwallis took him into his own household as one of the footmen who would deliver the food. You can imagine what type of access that gave to him as he overheard the plans and intentions and what, what have you. He slowly demonstrated by his service that he was a very bright, disciplined guy, and Cornwallis decided that since they had seen him wandering all around the lines before, they would use him to see if he could tell the British something about the American positions. So, he's, so Cornwallis decides he's going to double them back against the Americans. Armistead's all for this. Armistead wanders through the lines, reports to Lafayette. Lafayette says, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Here are what some of our frontline units look like. And you can say what their location is. You can say who the commanding officer is. You can say what their general strength is based on your observation. I want you to basically gain some rapport with Cornwallis. And this goes on for a couple of weeks until Cornwallis sends him across into American lines and Lafayette uses the opportunity to run the deception plan that is one of the keys to the victory at Yorktown. He writes in his own hand several dispatches to senior American commanders stating falsely that reinforcements have just arrived and their particular commands will be reinforced heavily. And he particularly mentions a couple who had recently fought with the British at places like Cowpen, so the impact is there. He puts it in a dispatch bag and tells Armistead, okay, you say that while you were out looking at the lines wandering around, you happened to find this. And since you obviously can't read, you don't know what it is. But you take it to the British officers and ask them if there's any value in it, which she subsequently did. And because it had been about six weeks of service for the British, where he had reported information on the Americans that they could document from their own observations, they believed that he was actually bringing in something legitimate. Plus, it was written in Lafayette's own hand. That was the information that stopped Cornwallis from moving his troops outside and expanding from the Yorktown redoubts in an attempt to try and control the, the water access that was so important in terms of resupply. A very, very important point of intelligence that had a direct impact on eventually allowing time for the French engineers and the American army to come down and set up the siege lines. Now, the problem here was that Armistead, after the war, hadn't been a soldier. So the House of Burgesses was only granting freedom to those uh, African Americans who had fought as soldiers in the war. It took a personal petition signed by Lafayette and five years to get poor James Armistead not only his freedom but the pension that he deserved. However, by the time he of about 1790, well into the 1830s. This was probably one of the more famous African-American patriots in the US. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's mostly of what we know about the, the contributions from an intelligence point of view. We're gonna do a little bit better with the Civil War. <clears throat> now, Vince had mentioned Black Dispatches. Black Dispatches was a phrase used, a title, if you will, for the most important and valuable intelligence information received by the Union forces. It was designated that as early as 1861 because it came only from slaves or freedmen who had come across in the Union lines. And it was valued so highly because in the largest sense, because of the oral tradition 
the information provided by these individuals, much more than the merchants or the others who came across the lines, were detailed and exact. You know, we often think of slaves in the South as nothing but field hands, doing, doing nothing but manual labor. The truth of the matter is, a good portion of the slaves actually did very technical jobs, what we would call sort of mechanic type jobs. They repaired equipment, they did blacksmithing, they served in some minor administrative posts, they certainly served in a form of etiquette in, in the, the plantation house itself that was extremely rigorous and, and regulated, none of which in terms of detail could be written down for them because they weren't allowed to read or write. They had to be able to memorize it. So you had some really sharp minds who could observe and provide incredible detail. And that is what the back Black Dispatches is all about. And it didn't take long for people to realize that. By 1862, as I said, that category was the most respected in terms of military intelligence being received. And we have that in the official documents of, of the Union Army. And indeed, by 1863, we've got Robert E. Lee stating that he is very well aware that the greatest leak of intelligence in all of our Confederate activities come from our Negroes. So he recognized that just as well. Union military, obviously, uh, because again, the need of manpower, after a couple years of war, vast numbers of, of African Americans served. Union intelligence assets, again, because of the nature of a civil war and because of the fact that there was then a structure, first Alan Pinkerton and then the Bureau of Military Information that understood intelligence well enough to realize you have to protect sources. We've got a lot of operational security here in terms of not allowing identification of sources. However, notice I put down here that there are nine individuals. Well, there's eight individuals that I can give you very solid documentation on that I'll talk about. There's one that I happen to believe very strongly in, but I can't document this, and some historians will tell you there is gonna be a debate about them. But we got a lot more detail on, on these people. Now, <clears throat> first one, obviously, is Harriet Tupman. In addition to all of the wonderful work she did with the Underground Railroad, going back and bringing people out. She also served under a union commander, bringing out intelligence and information on British, uh, excuse me, on Confederate locations, supply dumps, food repositories, the way roads were being used, the way bridges were being used, the way railroad were being conducted that were so important. She is a very unique individual because most people think of her primarily in terms of her role in the Underground Railroad. But in reality, for three years, she also operated as a behind the lines collector of tactical intelligence. And indeed, in the spring of 1863, she led a special unit of colored union troops, what today, a unit that definitely would be called a special operations unit, on a 78 mile march behind Confederate lines in South Carolina that ended up freeing several hundred black slaves, burning over 10,000 bales of cotton, and providing information on the transportation system for the Confederacy down at that point. A very impressive uh, act that is well, very well documented, to the point that when Ms. Tupman died in 1913, she was given a full military burial ceremony. So her role as an intelligence officer should not be, be thought. Uh, the earliest African-American slave that really had a significant impact is a gentleman named George Scott. He was a slave who came through Confederate lines and defected to Fort Monroe, the Union fortress at the very tip of the peninsula in Africa. And this was early in 1861. And the commander at the time was a Rhode Island man, uh, General Benjamin Butler. General, General Butler personally interviewed Mr. Scott, was very impressed once again with the details he had of the Confederate fortifications, both approaching Monroe and also around Norfolk, and asked Scott whether he would take a party of Union scouts out to look around the Norfolk area, which he subsequently did and came back. 
and brought back information causing Butler to realize that the Confederates were about to attack Norfolk, consequently shutting off the sea supply for Fort Monroe, which was the only Union fort at that time in, in uh, Virginia. Uh, subsequently, this is a beautiful example of really good intelligence that is well documented, but unfortunately the military campaign was poorly carried out and failed completely, but it wasn't a fault of intelligence. Charlie Wright. Charlie Wright is one of my favorites, and he's, I think, probably one of the most underrated spies of the Union uh, side during the Civil War. I'll tell you why. Charlie Wright came through Union lines down in Culpeper, Virginia, in the spring of 18, actually June of 1863. He's an individual who had been in Culpeper for several months, having moved his way up. And he had watched the army of, uh, General Lee's army of, of the valley move back and forth and had observed it very well. But in June of 63, when he came across lines and was immediately debriefed by people from the Bureau of Military Information, he said some surprising things. He described in detail that Lee's army seemed to be moving north into Maryland. And to back up this belief, he described several of the regiments in Longstreet's division and in Jackson's division, not only in terms of their commanding officer, but some of their lesser officers, the numbers they had, the routes they had taken. He provided order of battle detail that was so st strong and so detailed and firm that it fit right in with the order of battle that the Union forces had in Washington. This caused General Hooker, then commander of the Army of the Potomac, to agree that to protect Washington, which had primarily been the role of the Army of the Potomac for many, many years as opposed to being aggressive, to actually move his scouts and shadow on the other side of the Blue Ridge the Confederate forces as they moved up slowly towards Maryland and towards Pennsylvania. If it hadn't been for Charlie Wright convincing with good intelligence General Hooker could do that, Hooker would have never gotten to Gettysburg in time to get to good ground. Lee would have gotten there first to get to good ground. And there's still a lot of historical military debate here on the role of the Union cavalry, which was very late in coming to the decision that Lee's entire force was indeed moving up into Pennsylvania. So this is a strategic and tactical type of intelligence that is, to my way of thinking, immeasurably important. But then I would probably think that as a former intelligence officer. You don't hear a lot about him. He doesn't get much credit. Very important thing. Naval intelligence. Mary Traversi, a black woman who was freed and was the housekeeper in Norfolk for an engineer who happened to be working on the reconstruction of a Union ship that had been captured. Had been the USS Merrimack and it was being turned into the first ironclad, the CSS Virginia. Being a bright woman, she recognized listening to the engineer talking over dinner over the course of a couple weeks of the importance of this to his fellow engineers and knowing that at night he was working on the actual plans for the ship. One evening after they went to bed, she stole the plans to the CSS Virginia, moved out of Norfolk by ship, made it into Maryland, made it to Washington, went directly to the Secretary of the Navy gave him the plans. He looked at the plans, brought in his engineers, and saw how advanced they were, because they were also working on an ironclad, the USS Monitor. Because of her advising them of the rate of construction, they put 24-hour shifts on the Monitor. And the Merrimack, now the Virginia, only had two weeks in which to actually try to open up the entire Norfolk port area, port, port area. Had it been opened up, needless to say, from a viewpoint of supply, particularly from Europe, it would have been a very dangerous thing. Had she not taken the initiative to understand what was going on and grab those plans, 
It was estimated by the Navy Department at the time that the CSS Virginia would have had up to two months to totally destroy the blocking fleet that the Union had set up because they were all wooden hulled ships. Another tactical aspect here with W.H. Ringgold, who was a, another freed African American, but once the uh, war broke out, he had been sort of forced into becoming a river pilot and staying working various boats in the York River. He eventually did get to escape, and when he did escape, once again, his mind and his memory was such that he was able to write out for the War Department an entire list of the Confederate defenses along a river and an estimate of their own naval strength. And this was subsequently used by General McClellan in his Peninsula campaign as the basis for his understanding of the Confederate defenses. Robert Smalls, another individual, this time a individual who was a pilot of a boat in Charleston, South Carolina, once again was able to defect one Sunday morning, taking his entire family with him on a, a Confederate, what we would now call a tugboat, got out to the block blockaders and was able to give them the entire organization of the Confederate defense system since he had been working there for a year and a half. What was the impact of this? According to the message to President Lincoln, this was the information that allowed them to basically take control of and maintain the blockade of Charleston. And if you know anything about the, the southern portion during the Confederate War, Charleston was the railway hub for the entire resupply system of the South. The point I'm making with all of this is not just talking about intelligence, I'm talking about impact, significant impact on the war itself. William A. Jackson. <laughs> Mr. Jackson was, for a long period of time, the coachman for Jefferson Davis. And also, because he was well-liked by the Davis family as being a very effective servant, was also a butler during state meals and formal meals. Mr. Jackson managed after an appropriate amount of time to be able to escape to the north and supposedly gave a great deal of information on what he had overheard during the formal dinners on Jefferson Davis's plan and the military plans of the Confederacy. Now I gotta tell you there's some issues here because all we can find in the official documents of the Union Army is that he was able to provide extensive details about the plans and intentions of the Confederate Army based on orders from Jefferson Davis. What we get in the popular press, because Mr. Jackson becomes a bit of a press hero, what we get in the popular press and in newspapers at a time like Harper's Weekly is a little bit more of a propaganda thing, where in theory he came back and said Jefferson Davis's wife couldn't even buy clothes with Confederate money, and there were more Union men in Richmond than there were others. That's not, that, you know, that's propaganda. But when you look at the documents, it's fairly obvious that what he provided was right, fairly important. Also interesting to note, another little piece of research that is not, not normally looked at, he must have been a very articulate man because we find that in January of 1863, just a little small blurb in the newspaper indicating that he is in Manchester, England, speaking to tradespeople to drum up political support to ensure that Parliament in Great Britain does not lend any type of official recognition to or support to the Confederacy. This was all part of a larger Union propaganda effort, political action effort, if you will, it was being run. But you never see anything about that. Mr. Jackson disappears from the official documentation in late 62 after he's reported in, and we've got this information on what's going on inside the, the Confederate White House. But, then you, but when you look in the journal, you do find that here he is sitting over in Manchester doing that and being extremely effective getting the man, man Chester Trade Union to pass a resolution passed on their parliamentarians to support the Union cause. Uh, Elizabeth Bowser, Mary Elizabeth Bowser, a member of probably the most effective Union intelligence ring inside the Confederacy, which was known 
or actually worked for Elizabeth Van Yu, Van Lu, known as the Richmond Underground, which contained many African Americans because her family held a lot of African Americans who the Confederacy thought were slaves, but Van Lu's family actually had freed them. In the case of Miss Bowser, they had actually take, taken Miss Bowser earlier, sent her north to be educated, infiltrated her back under a different name and a different type of status, and she subsequently went to work and became a maid in Jefferson Davis's White House and eventually became a personal maid to Mrs. Davis herself. She supposedly had a photographic memory. And according to the documents in the Union Army, Bureau of Military Intelligence, she provided continuing and excellent access into the plans and activities from a political and military point of view being done in the Southern White House. Now, why can't I tell you specifically what she did? Well, because as in many cases, after the war, Miss Van Lu came up to Washington and got all of the files on her ring from the Bureau, the Army Bureau, took it back to Richmond and burned them because she had, her family had lived in Richmond for 200 some years and she knew she was gonna live in Richmond and this was her way of protecting it. So again, we only got half the story, but we got an interesting half. And this is the guy that historians are gonna argue about. This is an individual whose exploits are detailed in great, lengthy, comprehensive narrative in a book that uh, was written by Alan Pinkerton called The Spy of the Union, 1880-something uh, here. Let me see if I can figure out which, which year that was. That must have been 1882, the spy, actually the spy of the rebellion. John Scobell was a slave who had come across Union lines to seek freedom, was interviewed by Pinkerton's people who at that time were operating on a contract basis as the intelligence officers for General McLean's army. Scobell was again another impressive individual who seemed to have good observation skills, a good memory, a good sense of what was important from a military point of view. He was sent to Pinkerton Pinkerton enlisted him as one of his individuals who was actually sent back into Confederate lines to try and obtain positive intelligence as opposed to tactical or, or counterintelligence. And according to the book, acting primarily in the role of the, of the servant to one of the white agents, he made between 12 and 14 trips primarily into Virginia collecting information as he went. Normally, as when they get into a town or they get into Richmond, the principal officer would go and act as a merchant and attempt to make some kind of arrangements with local officials he had cultivated, or had pretended to have been a, a Southern sympathizer who lived on the Union side, et cetera, where Scobell would go and talk to the black population, and particularly to a black population called the Legal League, which in Southern Virginia, actually was a clandestine organization supporting the union cause with a slight overtone of also being a reporting channel for observational type of intelligence. He did a, he did a great deal. He was actually quite a, a remarkable collector in his own right. A lot of adventures talked about. If, you, if you're interested in, in kind of adventurous reading, I would suggest strongly that you do read the, this particular book. The problem here is that as I've mentioned before, Alan Pinkerton was a contractor. So when McLean, or Mc, uh, McClellan got fired by Lincoln and sent to West Virginia, obviously Pinkerton no longer had a job as head of intelligence, but he was a contractor. So he went to the War Department and he said, I want all my records because they're mine. They're not the US government's, they're mine as a contractor. And he took them with him back to Chicago. And he put him in his building in Chicago, and unfortunately, in 1890, they had a huge fire that destroyed all of the records. One of the problems. It was also a bit of a problem for Union Army, I might add, because I had to reconstruct all of their records from field reports, since he was able to do that. A beautiful example of contractors in the military. <laughs> Think about it. So, basically, 
That is the story I'd like to tell you. I wish I, could, I wish I could give you more detail. I am constantly looking for more detail. I will tell you that if we were to go on the popular regional stories about black heroic activities, both in the military and in the intelligence field, we could write a very, very good book on that. But I'm afraid that attempting to be a historian, I've got to stick to something that at least is documented or a bit more prominent. I will tell you that Vince mentioned something about my expertise, which I readily admit is minor. The individual who probably did the best work on this is a, is a gentleman who's now deceased, Dr. Benjamin Quarles, who was a uh, academic in New Orleans in the 40s and 50s, wrote two very prominent books for the period. The first was The Negro in the American Revolution. The second was The Negro in the Civil War. A lot of the initial leads, if you will, on the Civil War spies and the Revolutionary War spies come from his initial work. Unfortunately, he passed along before a gentleman named Edward Fischel, who wrote The Secret War for the Union, actually went into the archives over here, cut the red tape from the Bureau of Military Information, and delved deep enough to expose people in a meaningful way like Mary Trevisi and Charlie Wright and some of the others. So he simply wasn't, he had passed on by the time more research was open to him. But he, he's the individual who's really the founder in all of this. Can you take some questions? I certainly would be happy to. Yes, sir. Hold on one second, wait for the mic. Oh, mic. Okay. Uh, just a comment, apparently, apparently Mary Elizabeth Bowser was not only a spy, but Towards the end of the Civil War, when they found her out, she tried to burn down the Confederate White House <laughs> before she fled. <laughs> well, you may, as you probably know, she, is, she was inducted into the Army Intelligence Hall of Fame at Fort, uh, Fort Uchuka, Kansas. So, I mean, her, her work is, is well appreciated. A little late in coming to, to the fore, but well appreciated. I want to know what's your favorite um, pop culture unsubstantiated spy person, if you'd. Oh, well. If you'd share that. I like the story of, and you know, if you know anything, if, you, if you've seen Turn or you know anything about the Culper Ring, we got this thing where Anna Armstrong is hanging laundry of various types up, which is a signal to, to a courier boat that is supposed to come over and, and empty a dead drop and what have you. The Civil War has at least five popular stories of Afro-American housewives behind enemy lines, two in the Tidewater, one in South Carolina, and one in Mississippi, signaling to her husband, who had defected already to the Union side seeking freedom, providing daily descriptions of what the Confederate lines look like. I mean, that's my favorite because it is such a popular one. Got one over here. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed the double agent story. That, that's really fantastic. My question is, did Canada play a role at all? We know a lot of uh, African Americans were lucky enough to get to Canada. Was there any interplay there where they returned, uh, where perhaps some local government officials returned them to, to help out? in any of these? I take it you mean the Civil War period here. Yeah. Yeah. Of, uh, yeah that, this, this becomes a little confused. The uh, Confederates and the Union both ran active intelligence and political action operations in Canada as they did in Europe. But there was not a great role to play on the part of the black uh, African American. If they made it to Canada often, that was simply their freedom, which is what they wanted. There's an interesting juxtaposition here that is not particularly gracious to, to any of us. In both wars, the position regarding slaves was very close to the same until the end of both wars. During the Revolutionary War, the British said, if you've got a slave and you're on our side, hey, that's good. But if there's a slave who happens to be working for a patriot, if he crosses over, we'll give him his freedom, which sometimes worked, sometimes didn't. Not unlike the Emancipation Proclamation, where if you were a Southerner and you had a slave, 
we would take them as contra contraband and eventually free them. But if you were in a union portion where there was slavery, it would take a while before we would, we would affect that. Policy was driven primarily by the pragmatism of manpower and what the politics looked like. Here's one. Oh. Yeah. oh, thank you. Um, no, I just wanted to know, is there any way to know if uh, the contract or the agreement was honored um, that the slaves were set free once they fought uh, in, the, in the two wars? Oh, yeah, they, they were honored. They were indeed honored. I mean, when the Continental Congress finally, and now the money took a little bit longer to actually go out in terms of pensions, but no. Uh, and George Washington was very firm on this during his presidency, that, the, that this be honored regardless of, of who it was because there were pension issues with anybody who had served in the Continental Forces. The problem here, speaking as an intelligence officer, is you know we, the intelligence assets were not considered the same. They, they had not fought per se, although they had obviously done things that were just as dangerous and in many cases had a greater impact, but they were not recognized within the legal definition of having been in, in, in a military service. Consequently, it took a lot of work on a lot of people's parks to get, get them recognized. And Amistad is only a, a classic example of this. There were many others as well. We had one over here. Thank you for such an excellent talk. I actually have a comment and also a question. Um, the comment is actually on display at the American History Museum of Smithsonian. They have a gallery on African American museum that's going to open this September, and they actually have Harriet Tubman's original um, uh, pension papers, mm -hmm. uh, which evidently took years before they offered her a pension. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to see that, it's on display right now. Um, and you may want to comment on that, because I don't know why it took them a long time. And then my question is about the portrait of the Revolutionary War um, gentleman, Mr. Ar Armstead. Armstead. Um, like, do we know who did that? And because I mean, it's so rare for a portrait of an African American, exactly. anyway. Um, so, if you would comment on that too. Yes, the reason behind that was that in 1824, Lafayette came back to the United States for his final tour, and during that time, he met with all of his friends, and he met with Armistead. And while he and Armistead were together, Armistead. Uh, Lafayette commissioned an individual whose name I do not know, although I'm sure the Valentine Museum knows, who did paint a portrait of him. An extra reason for I mean, uh, Lafayette felt that Armistead had been an, an, an incredible, valuable resource. Uh, there, yeah, there's some very fascinating stories. I mean, folklore again. Folklore being that because Armistead had for a period of time served as a waiter or a butler or what have you in Cornwallis's mess that after the, the surrender at Yorktown, when Cornwallis did not surrender, he sent a second guy out to surrender, but, but he did agree to come to dinner with Lafayette. And there is a folklore story that at the dinner, as a joke, Lafayette had Armistead act as the server for Cornwallis to see if Cornwallis would recognize who he was. And in theory, he didn't. Now, again, that's not documented, but that's a very popular story that you'll find in the Yorktown area. Ken, can I just add, so the painting of Armistead is on view at the Valentine Museum, which is in Richmond. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks again, just echoing, um, uh, thanks for how comprehensive this talk was. Interested to um, hear about uh, any sort of data points you might have, any discoveries you've made of African Americans during this time period, Union assets who were uncovered, discovered, and then, of course, subsequently persecuted. Um, any, anything you might share about that? No, I've, I've got to say, I have not found much of that. I had mentioned that Ms. Van Lu got her files and destroyed them. I'd mentioned that Alan Pinkerton, like a good contractor, screwed up and took his stuff back home and burned it. The last thing the Confederate forces did before they evacuated Richmond was to burn all of their intelligence files, including their counterintelligence files, which would have been the identification of, of such individuals. So I, I have not been able to find anything in the records of the Grand Army of the Republic or the documentation that indicates that we know of 
something like that. My, my suspicion would be that if you find something like that, it would have to be in state records. And if you consider the chaos during a period of reconstruction and a lack of actual records and documents for that time in most of the southern states, could be a very hard row to hoe in terms of trying to find data points. Spying in itself, unless you've got a distinctive good guy and bad guy, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing to research compared to economics, politics, or, or something else, just because of operational security. Even in, even in the Cold War, and even though the, the agency and others are doing a much better job of releasing things before the 50-year time frame, it's very hard to do research on intelligence. I know I have attempted to get the agency to release uh, an operation that I was involved in, and I've, I've been told very plainly that it'll be 30 years after I die before it'll ever see the light of day. So I it was just the nature of the work. Um, of the individuals you've highlighted this evening, I'm just curious how many, if uh, of your knowledge, were um, illiterate. I'm just curious how many would provide information strictly from recollection rather than from notes or something. Well, the ones that I indicated were highly educated, and there were a lot of them. And interestingly enough, many of them were owned by individuals of Scotch descendancy. I don't know what the tie-in is here, but fascinatingly enough, Scotch believed in educating their servants, apparently, reading and writing more than others. The only one I can tell you for sure that I think was illiterate was Charles Wright. Mary Trevesi uh, obviously was well educated in the North. Jackson must have been very articulate, or he wouldn't have been sent to do public speaking in a propaganda way in, in, in London. Uh, Ringo, Ringwall and all, yeah, it's hard to say because that, that really wasn't emphasized. What was appreciated about black dispatches as a category and the authority that that gave as a source when it came down as black dispatches was based on the fact that the individual really could observe and remember and could give vast amounts of detail compared to someone else. Again, the oral and, and memory concept of, of experience in doing your job since you weren't allowed to write down anything in the way of, of rules and manuals. Oh, here we go. Hi, I just want to remind people that the National Archives has a part two, which is located in College Park. They have a ton of records, military records, and um, you can also check pension records and lots of records related to blacks and people that served in the different wars. So please come down. They're open um, and they're so sessionized. Thank you. You're doing some good PR in the museum <laughs> community. I appreciate that. Vince, do you want to close it out? or? If you have a question, we don't want to close out. Going okay. once, going twice. Yeah. Um, oh, we got wait. One. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Come on. Never mind. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, who is your most favorite spy and why? And had you been able to uncover any triple agents? Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, Washington used several of his better agents as what you would call as a layman, and I would call a double agent, but you call a triple agent, who were so well embedded in the British structure that they were used as exclusive couriers between the major commanders, primarily up the Hudson in the New England area between New York, Philadelphia, and Quebec and Montreal. And they were so important because when Washington finally did his ultimate deception plan that resulted in the set piece battle at Yorktown, keeping Clinton constantly concerned about New York being attacked, uh, yeah, uh, he actually used these people as conveyors of false information. He was willing to risk all that he had built and the ability to surreptitiously tap into their command flow of information for this deception plan. That's, that's gutsy. That's the height of, of aggressive counterintelligence, let me tell you.
All right. Well, please join me in thanking Ken Dagler for taking the time to talk to us here tonight. Um, thank you, Ken. Uh, in all seriousness, if you're, if you're interested more about this, uh, Ken and I have done a podcast together. Uh, our podcast series here at the museum is called SpyCast. We sat down and we talked about his book. We talked about intelligence, both African-American women during this entire time period from the Revolution to the Civil War. Uh, it's free. Uh, it's on iTunes and on our website. So take, take a listen to it because he and I had a great conversation about all of this.